Hello, welcome to the Museum and Archives of Rockingham County, otherwise known as the MARG. My name is Matthew Titchener, I'm the Executive Director, and today I'm going to take you on a very special virtual tour of our newest exhibit, Heavy Other Scales, Griggs v Duke Power. Our newest exhibit recognises and celebrates this landmark civil rights case where, in 1971, 13 African American men from Rockingham County risked everything to fight for workplace equity and won. Now, exactly 50 years on, at a time when we are all taking stock, re-examining our rich and complex history and reckoning with the sometimes difficult legacy history leaves behind, it has never been more imperative for cultural spaces like the Mark to stop, listen and uplift these sometimes marginalised footnotes of the past. A new exhibit lies in our civil rights room, which for those who've not visited the mark, situated in the old county courthouse, the room charts the history of Rockingham County activism and achievers fighting for equality. The room teases out the threads that run from the early freedmen with the aid of personal historic objects through desegregation, changing attitudes, and how Rockingham County fits with the national story. Talk of civil rights, and most people will think of the iconic Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, given at the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. But not as many people are aware that after his assassination in 1968, the civil rights movement did not suddenly end there, and nor was true equity achieved. But this is the way that it is often taught. By readdressing this convenient historical bookend to the way we teach the civil rights movement, we hope our new exhibit will demonstrate the struggles for equity continued long after towering figures like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Distilling the last few years of research, the new exhibit breaks down the case into four main sections. The background, the complaint, the decision and the legacy. To give context, the 13 plaintiffs in Griggs v Duke Power lived in a world segregated by race. During the Jim Crow era, African Americans were routinely only hired in the lower paying jobs. This occupational hierarchy has, by many historians, been identified as one of the main pillars of the Jim Crow racial caste system, with African Americans actively limited to the lower rungs of the labour force. In the mid-1960s, at Duke Power Company Steam Station in Draper, North Carolina, which is now Eden, had hundreds of employees. Among those, the would-be plaintiffs all worked in the Labour Department, listed as janitors. But despite their experience, and their proficiency, even filling in for other departments when needed, they were routinely denied promotions and transfers within the company and also suffered a stark pay gap with other company departments. Tube Power Company, like so many companies at the time, introduced arbitrary intelligence tests and requirements such as a high school diploma for those wanting to work outside any of the departments other than general labour. These tests had little bearing with the advertised jobs or about selecting proficient candidates but disproportionately impacted African-American workers. On top of which, white employees were on many occasions promoted without a high school diploma. By 1966, 81 of the four higher paying departments of coal handling, laboratory and tests, operations and maintenance of equipment were all white. Encouraged by members of the local Reedsville chapter of the NAACP, especially its president, James A. Griggs, the 13 plaintiffs put their families, their safety and their livelihoods on the line to fight for greater equality and officially challenge these employee requirements. Claiming that they were unrelated to job performance and requesting the right to promotion when vacancies should occur, the claim was filed officially in October of 1966. And behind me here, you can see the signatures of those men on an image of that original complaint document. Signed by Junior Blackstock, Willie Boyd, Eddie Broadnax, Eddie Galloway, Willie Griggs, Lewis Hairston Jr., John Hatchett, Clarence Jackson, Robert Jumper, Herman Martin, Jesse Martin, Clarence Purcell, William Purcell and James Tucker. All but Jesse Martin would go on to fight the case in court. Jesse had a high school diploma from Booker T. Washington High School in Reedsville and was promoted to the coal handling department two months before the case went to court. 
Little did the 13 men know then that their case would be a protracted one and go all the way to the top. Represented by NAACP legal defence attorneys led by Julian Chambers, it took nearly five years to work its way through the court system until it was finally heard before the US Supreme Court in December 1970. For those visiting the mark, QR codes like this one will take you to a host of resources related to exhibit content. This one will take you to that very US Supreme Court reading in 1970. Let's listen to a clip. Mr. Greenberg, you may proceed. Uh, no employer we submit under the statute is required to employ anyone who is unable to do the job. Uh, and any employer may use tests and educational requirements which predict whether an employee or a prospective employee can do the job. But if the test that's used or the educational requirement that's used screens out members of a race or of a group protected by the statute and does not predict who can do the job, uh, then it cannot be justified merely on the basis of good faith. Now, as I said, Duke Power Company adopted the test requirement for initial employment on July 2nd, 1965, the date of the act in question. Until then, and until after the filing of the charge in this case, in fact, uh, employment at Duke Power Company was rigidly racially segregated. Uh, black persons worked in the labor department only. White persons worked in the better and higher paying jobs. That is the department described in the record of operations, maintenance, test and laboratory, and coal handling. And the highest paid black worker made less money than the lowest paid white worker under this system. Then, on March 8th, exactly 50 years ago today, the decision finally came. The Supreme Court unanimously sided with the 13 African American plaintiffs in a landmark victory. They held at Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, prohibited employment criteria that could be used in a racially exclusionary fashion. They held too that whilst these criteria may not have appeared on the surface discriminatory, they did in fact have a disproportionate impact on African Americans both being hired and promoted within Duke Power Company. This, in its essence, was preserving the same racial segregationist system that existed during the Jim Crow era. This rationale came to be known as the disparate impact theory. And this theory had a huge effect, not just on the civil rights movement, but employers across the country. Hailed as a watershed decision, akin in importance to Brown v Board of Education, it underscored and highlighted how employment norms at the time were vehicles for institutional racism, denying economic opportunity to swathes of historically excluded groups. Now, looking back, the legacy of Grigsby Duke Power Company simply cannot be understated. It highlighted the impactful role black working class activism played in the civil rights movement, and it broke down seemingly immovable barriers to employment, not just for African Americans, but later women and other groups fighting for equity. And disparate impact theory also became an invaluable legal tool in helping dismantle institutional racism, segregation, and other forms of discrimination in the workplace. Visitors can visualize this legacy through the exhibit's workplace equity timeline. Spanning from the end of the Civil War through the centuries, visitors will be able to pinpoint events that led to Griggs, where Griggs fits in, and the landmarks that Griggs led to. We hope by looking back in this way, it will help our audiences of all ages better understand where we are today. It's safe to say that those 13 brave men who put everything on the line would scarcely have believed that their stand would alter the course for thousands of black workers across America, opening new opportunities for future generations to the betterment of whole communities. That being said, in 1971, the reception was not all positive. The media coverage, was extremely limited and critics claimed at the time that it placed too much burden on employers hiring and setting promotion standards. Numerous legal challenges attempted to reverse the decision over the subsequent decades, but fortunately disparate impact theory and the case's legacy held firm. 50 years on, 
The Mark team has sought to not only preserve what little material remained related to the Griggs case, but look deeper than the court transcripts to add the humanising element back to the 13 men and their journeys. Through Mark's Oral Histories initiative, we've managed to capture some of the family members' vital stories and memories of these men before the history becomes lost to us forever. These play a vital part in the new exhibit taking centre stage. Here are a few short clips. My name is Brenda Blackstock Matthews, and my father was Junior Blackstock. Uh, my name is Stephen Jumper. I am the son of Robert Allen Jumper, Sr. My name is Scotia Hurston Wade, and my father is Louis Hurston. He and some of the guys from the plant used to go deep sea fishing, too. He was a pillar uh, in, in our community. Uh, and particularly in the Black community. He was someone that young men of all backgrounds looked up to. I was very proud of my father uh, with the case, and I had no idea how important this case was until I was in college taking a, a class about law, and I can believe it was in the textbooks. My nieces and nephews, not only in the ministry, some are in law enforcement. We have a diversified family, and I can see some of those things would not have happened if somebody didn't help open up the door so that they would have opportunities like all Americans should have. There was a lot of fear there, very lot of fear. This is why a lot of men would not go to the meetings. They were afraid they would lose their job. I ended up in the public utility, do power for the last two decades of my professional career. You know, it's just, it's just so ironic. I, I was a management employee. And so, gosh, I mean, Matthew, there couldn't have been a better passing of the torch. And these precious histories are something Mark is continuing to collect as we reach out to more family members. So if anyone is connected to the case, please do get in touch with us. For our younger audience members, for whom the 70s might seem more like ancient history, the exhibit also sports a dress-up corner, complete with 70s funky checks, prints and corduroy. And not to be left out, we do have adult clothes too to try on. These are accompanied by 70s trivia from the price of groceries to a QR code that will take you to the US number one hit song on March the 8th, 1971. Part of the exhibit also takes the form of a chalk wall, where visitors are encouraged to write messages or ask questions to the historical figures who fought for equity and those advocating for a more equal society today. Your stories will become a feature of the exhibit itself. And finally, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all those who made the project possible. Thank you to our speaker, Valencia Abbott, whose tireless dedication and research provided the nucleus for this project. Thank you to our headline speaker, Professor Cynthia Elaine Tompkins, for both investing and lending your wealth of experience. A heartfelt thank you, of course, to the 13 plaintiffs and their families for opening your precious stories, memories and experiences so others can learn about this poignant history and perhaps inspire visitors to take away those same lessons into their own lives. Thank you to Duke Energy for their support and assistance and also their foundation's recognition of bringing positive change in their recently announced $1 million pledge to organisations committed to social justice and equity. I'd like to give a big shout out also to the Reedsville Area Foundation and Town of Wentworth for both investing in the Mark's mission and awarding us the grants to make this exhibit possible, as well as, of course, members of the public who so generously donated too. And lastly, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the Mark team who've worked and volunteered tirelessly through the challenges of the pandemic, proofreading, photographing, researching behind the scenes and transforming the exhibit space into what you see today. We hope you enjoyed Mark's first virtual tour and we will continue reaching out in new ways and looking forward to the day when we can eventually safely welcome visitors once more through our doors.